That feeling, you can only say what it is in French. First of all, let me quickly apologize for the lighting. It's just one of those days where I just can't get the fucking lighting right. But I'm not going to apologize for if you can hear the blues music in the background. The guy I live with is a blues musician and he's playing the blues with the devil behind me in the house. <clears throat> I wasn't going to do this review today because <clears throat> I just couldn't think of a way to talk about it. But that's piss weak. So we're just going to fucking talk about it right now with no notes, no nothing. Surprise, surprise, it's another Stephen King short story from the short story collection, Everything's Eventual, that came out in 2002. The story is called That Feeling You Can Only Say What It Is in French. Now, it's a clever title. Um, that Feeling You Can Only Say What It Is in French is Deja Vu. Now, if I was to tell you, like, you know, oh, fuck, I had this feeling, man. I've got that feeling. Um, you know, it's like I've done this before, or I've dreamt this before, or I've been here before. That takes a long time to explain that. Not that long, but longer than the words deja vu. And all of us people, I'm, well, fuck, man, I'm from Australia, but most people I know know kind of what I mean when I say deja vu. And this story is a short story. I'm going to call it a horror story. Um... It's Stephen King, you know, it's got that dark horror element. But it's pretty original in saying that. It's, it is and it isn't. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we'll just get stuck right the fuck into this. Uh, that feeling you can only say what it is in French is about a couple. Carol and Bill. They're on their 24th... Five year honeymoon, which is like what? Your silver anniversary? I'm pretty sure it's your silver anniversary. This story begins with Carol in a car um, and Bill driving, and they're heading to this, you know, kind of a rich, swanky place where they're going to have their, you know, a second honeymoon. It's been 25 years. Now, straight away, I'll just explain. This story isn't really told in much dialogue. The story is told by the main character, which is Carol. And it's not told with words. It's told with how she's thinking. It's only like a 10, maybe 12 page short story. But we get all the information we need uh, with her just thinking about her life. So we start off with her in the passenger seat and they're heading for their second honeymoon. And... She's thinking about how her and Bill first got together. She comes from a really religious family um, who pretty much disowned her when they found out that um, she was marrying this guy, Bill. Uh, you know, he's going to fuck you over. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. 25 years is a strong, long marriage. But as we go on, we find out they've had their hiccups. They started off with fuck all money. They used to live in this terrible apartment building full of cockroaches, drug dealers living upstairs, playing some fucking repetitive 60s music over and over again and she always thought man we're never getting out of here but here we are with carol now and you know they're in their 50s and she's like well we certainly are a lot further along than that than we were when we started <clears throat> as we go along though and we get in carol's head we realize you know there was a rough patch in the middle she had an abortion um uh, Bill cheated on her with a secretary and they had to go through some hardcore marriage fucking bullshit. Um, but she stayed with him. But we introduced to these characters by watching their marital traits together. We got 25 years and they're sitting in this car. And he's being a bit of a dick, um, even though they're heading for their second honeymoon. They're supposed to be like really making a go of this. But she's very used to like the dimple in his cheek or when he furrows his brow. And he's like, oh, are you okay? But she can tell he's pissed off about something. And they just... She's not happy. And she hasn't been really happy since the beginning. But she was raised to believe, like, you know, you, you stick by this guy or, or whatever. She certainly stuck by him anyway through some hell bullshit. And he's not very likable. Carol, on the other hand, is quite a likable character in this story. Now, they're driving along and they're heading for this place, uh, some some rich place where they're probably going to spend a week there, you know, fucking eating lobster, drinking fucking pina coladas, charge the MasterCard at the end of it, and it's probably going to be pretty pretty expensive. I'm pretty sure Bill's some computer programmer these days, and he makes some okay money. But she starts getting that feeling. 
And that's what this story's about. She's driving along and she starts to get that feeling. That feeling you can only say what it is in French. She starts to get the feeling of deja vu. Like, they go around a corner in the car and she thinks, fuck, like we've driven this road before. But no, 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 because on our first honeymoon, we were in this area, but we were on the other side of the bay. So it can't be that. Maybe I dreamt that we were driving along this road and she's like, no, the feeling is too strong. It's such a strong feeling of deja vu that it's almost suffocating and we can feel it with her. Like it's, when you're reading it, it's written really well so that we're kind of feeling the way she's feeling. She can't explain it to Bill um, because she doesn't even know how to explain it. She's just getting that feeling. And she says to him, what's that feeling? And he's like, what? Like that feeling, you can only say what it is in French. He's like, oh, deja vu. She's like, that's it, deja vu. I've like, I just had some really strong deja vu. She's, um, they go around the corner and she thinks, in her head, she thinks, when we get around this corner, there's going to be a billboard on the left side of the road and it's going to say this. When they get around the corner, there is no billboard. But when they get further up the road, there is a billboard on the right and it doesn't say what she thought it was going to say. It says something similar and the feeling gets stronger, even though as we're reading it, it's like, well, it's not really right because she didn't get it right at all. Then she thinks, when I go around this next corner, there's going to be three crosses on that side of the road and two crosses on that side of the road and, uh, and a mailbox, something like that. They get around the corner and that isn't there, but there's two big black crows in the middle of the road and they're eating some kind of roadkill and they've been snacking hard, so this thing is just a, like a bit of a paste of red on the fucking blacktop. And the crows fly away as their big flash rental car goes through it. And she's like, well, fuck. This can't be deja vu because that's not what I thought was going to happen. But that feeling, it persists. It persists really strong and it's only getting stronger. It's making her feel a bit sick. It's making her feel like she can't breathe. Then she thinks that when she goes down the road, they're going to pass this place called Colson's. When they do pass it, it's called Carson's. She starts to get fucking nervous. Now... They get further up the road, and the deja vu is what we're concentrating on in this part of the story. They start sort of arguing because Bill's like, are you okay? Like, you're sitting upright in your chair, and you're looking pale. Like, are you alright? She's like, yeah, it's just cramps, you know, it's just cramps. I just need to get into some shorts and just relax. And he starts being a bit sleazy, like, to her. Not sleazy, I mean, fuck, they're married. But he's like, oh, well, maybe we can take a break when you change into them shorts and, you know, have a bit of a fucking married couple fucking hanky-panky. She's like, oh, I'd love that. It's the furthest thing from her mind. This feeling that she's got, this strong sense of deja vu just still persists. Now, I don't know about you, but when I've had deja vu, it's very quick, strong, but fleeting. It goes away pretty quick and you're not even sure if it was a dream, if maybe... Yeah, it's just that feeling. Um, but it doesn't last. It doesn't last, you know, hours as you're driving down the road. It's, it's very fleeting. But with Carol, it is lasting. And then they're about, let's say, like 20 minutes from their destination. And she starts to get an itchy head. And she starts to scratch her. And all this black stuff starts to fall out of her hair. And she looks over at Bill and she's like, Bill, like, what, what's going on, you know? And her head's really itchy. And he looks at her and he's like, what's that in your hair? Like, what, like, are you okay? And his voice changes. And she hears all these voices in her head. And she scratches her head some more. And all this like burnt paper comes out of her hair. And, she, and the feeling, that, that deja vu feeling is just so intense right now. She's just fucking, she's choking. She looks over at her husband, Bill, driving the car. And his face starts to run like melted fucking skin. And his glasses get melted to his face. And blood, and holy shit, and fuck, and then she wakes up. She wakes up on a plane. And Bill wakes her up, and they're about to land. The plane is about 18,000 feet, starting to descend. So they haven't landed yet, but when they do land, they're going to get their rental car, and they're going to go on their second honeymoon. Now, that's her having deja vu, or maybe it was a dream. But the feeling you get when you read this book, it's like... That was a little bit too precise for it to be just a dream. But she can't explain it to him. And you know what it's like when you wake up. Like, the, 
like whatever that dream you were hanging on to, it, it escapes pretty quickly. So already she's thinking like, was I driving in the dream? Like, was there something on the side of the road? Side of what road? Ah, oh, it must just be bullshit. So at 16,000 feet, the plane goes through a bit of turbulence. Sorry, excuse me, I've got an itchy eye. And they, um, and eventually they land. And they get out of the plane. And they go to their rental car, which is waiting for them at the airport. And then they get in the car. And this is the part where we find out a bit more about the couple, about the secret him cheating with the secretary, and just sort of their history a bit more. We're still in Carol's head, and we're finding out, you know, um, these characters, which is what I always say is what Stephen King's really good at. There is a theme here. It's a deja vu theme. We've already had a bit of scary horror and gore and supernatural, possibly dream states going on. But we invested in these characters because they're interesting and they have a backstory. They have personalities of their own. They're original. They're driving along the road and then there it comes, that feeling. You can only say what it is in French, but this time it's even stronger. And as she comes around that first bend, she's like, the billboard won't be on the left. It'll be a bit further up on the right and it'll be a statue of Mary. Like, you know, um, you know, Mary from Catholic churches, you know, mother of God. And it'll have a sign there. And in her head, she thinks what the sign might say. But when they get, get up there, it is Mary. And her arms are out like that. And the sign says, welcome to Florida. Um, please help feed our homeless. What can you do to help us? And it's like, she knew that billboard was going to be there. She didn't know Mary was going to be on it. Or maybe she kind of did. Sorry, some big dickhead on his motorbike just flew past my house. Um, but yeah, she's... This feeling, this deja vu she's getting now, and we're kind of realising as we're reading this book, it's happening again, only this time it's stronger. This time, she realises that the name of the building isn't Colson's, it's Carson's. She knows where the letterbox is going to be, and she knows there's not going to be crosses on this side or that side. She's pretty aware that there's going to be something in the middle of the road, possibly getting eaten by birds. And we get our two crows flying off from the roadkill that they're eating. Now, we've done this before. So she. But we thought it might have been a dream. But this time, we're in, a, we're in a repetition here. And the deja vu is even stronger. And it's making her even sicker. And Bill's saying the same things. Like, are you okay? Like, you know, you don't seem like yourself. You're sitting upright in your chair. And she's like, oh, it's just cramps, just cramps. She feels like screaming out and saying, listen, Bill, there's something wrong here, but she doesn't know how to put it in, into words. Like, what is wrong? It's just a feeling. It's just a deja vu feeling. That's, it's just a feeling you can only say what it is in French. So what is it? They get further down the road, and she's getting more things right. She's picking things where they're going to be, even though they're not exactly right, but they're getting righter. Sorry about that. More accurate. Um then suddenly her head gets itchy and she scratches at it and all the black paper starts coming out of her hair and she's like no 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 this is this is this this can't be happening i don't know what's happening but it can't be happening again she looks over at her husband and his glasses are melting to his face and it's running like wax with blood and she can hear him screaming and she tries to scream but she can't even get out a scream then she wakes up and bill's waking her up on the plane again this time, it's, she can hold on to that feeling way more. Like, like she's wide awake. Like, what's the matter? Bill asks her. It's like, ah. And she can't say what happened. She doesn't know how to put it into words, but she's like, all she can say is, I had a, I had a really bad nightmare. He's like, well, you shouldn't have slept on the plane. Come on, we're nearly landing. And the car will be waiting for us. And we'll head off on down the road. This time, she's like... She's got this feeling even even stronger. And it's like, she wants to scream at the pilot. Like, there's something wrong here. Um, don't go through that bit of turbulence again. But they go through the turbulence. And the plane lands safely. And Bill, Bill, like the dickhead he is, flirts with the lady that gives him the rental car. And it pisses her off a little bit. And she kind of knows that he's going to do it with the deja vu feeling and she gets it really spot on this time they get in the car and they start driving off and the exact same things happens again only this time she's getting it perfect like okay two crows eating the roadkill 
the Mother Mary saying, welcome to Florida, feed our homeless. Uh, two kilometers down the road, there will be another billboard on the other side saying, welcome to Florida again, please do what you can to feed the homeless. Her husband starts getting a bit grabby on her leg, like, oh, maybe we should fool around when we get to the hotel. And she's like, yeah, sure. She's screaming on the inside. Something is happening here. I'm stuck in a repetitive loop. I need to get Bill to stop the car, pull over something, something to stop what's fucking coming next. I don't want to see his face melt. I don't want fucking my hair to catch on fire. What's going on? And she knows Carson's is the next building there. She knows what's coming up. She knows the statue of, you know, the painting of Mary is going to be there. And she's getting it perfect this time. And then it happens. Her hair, you know, uh, burning and all the, all the ash coming out and her hands full of her. And his face melting and the glasses melting. This time, she knows. And it's like she wakes up on the plane and this time she's aware she knows, man. The plane crashes at 16,000 feet. Uh, she knows. She's gone through... We've, we've gone through this with her three times. And this is the last time. And the plane... The plane crashes with them on it. It crashes as it's landing in Florida. Yet it does land. Without crashing. And they get in the car. And the feeling is stronger than ever. And they drive off down the road. And she's thinking about that statue of Mary. And she's thinking about hell. And she was thinking about how religiously she was raised. And she was thinking about repetition. And she was thinking about choices you can make before you get to a certain point. And she's got a memory of her grandmother saying, listen, hold on to that. Hold on to Mother Mary, Mother of God. Because the tough stuff, the hard stuff comes later like later in life, and we all know it does. As kids, you know, we, we're raised to believe this, that, or the other, but we know as adults, things get harder. People die, accidents happen, people get murdered, people get killed, planes crash. And uh, we left right there with her thinking about our grandmother talking to her about religion, Catholicism, really, saying, you know, make sure you hold on to yourself because the harder stuff is further on down the road the end now there's a little note at the end by Stephen King a couple of fucking sentences where he explains what this story means to him and why he wrote it and he says I think this story is about hell purgatory and a, you know some famous person who was it? I think it was Friedrich Nietzsche said hell is other people Stephen King seems to think that hell is repetition, a purgatory. You're stuck in that loop how you died. We don't know why uh, this couple went to hell. They certainly weren't the most innocent couple in the world. I don't know if they were hellbound, but who's to say? But King himself thinks maybe this is his story about hell and him writing that hell is purgatory and hell is repetition. And that's our story. That feeling you can only say what it is in French. They die in that plane crash. And they're stuck in a loop. Now this morning when I read it again. Because I've read it. And I always read it. I read it fresh for you guys. So I can have a chat to you. When I read it again this morning. I was a bit stuck on the fact that the plane lands. And she can pick out all the, the roadside stuff. And that's where the deja vu kicks in. But I was wondering, like, if they die on the plane, how does she have any memories or any kind of deja vu reflections about, you know, them driving down the road for 100 kilometres? And then it happens when they're on, in the car on the road. I was going to say to you, that bit doesn't make any sense to me. And you know me, I refuse to Google things. So I'm telling you what I think I know based on reading the story. I'm not going to fucking Google somebody else's opinion um, on what they think the meaning of this story is. I don't know the meaning of this story. I know that Stephen King thinks it's about hell and purgatory. I know he's very cleverly used the idea of deja vu, that feeling that we've all felt, and that feeling that you can only say what it is in French. But I think the car thing, the fact that it all starts happening to her while she's in the car, and a reflection of her life, 
25 years with this Bill guy has a lot to do with it. Now, I went and saw my cousin Ben this morning, and I was telling him that I was going to review this. And I was telling him that I didn't really like, not so much like, but I didn't really get the whole car stuff. Like, why did it happen in the car, and why didn't it just happen on the plane? Like, how did she know what was going to happen after they landed? Because they never fucking landed. They died on the plane. Um, and he put it to me this way. And this doesn't explain anything. He mentioned two movies. He mentioned Groundhog Day, uh, written and directed by Hal Ramis and starring Bill Murray, and how, you know, Bill Murray was stuck in that circle. And, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's certain things that happen in that movie where every now and then there's like an outside agent that isn't stuck in that loop. Um, but there's certain people you can't save. There's certain things you can't fix. So in Groundhog Day, there's the homeless guy that Bill Murray keeps trying to make not die on the street. Because that day, that night, the homeless guy dies every night. So he takes him out for dinner, feeds him soup, keeps him warm, has a heart attack every time, and he dies every time. And it breaks Bill Murray's heart. There's, there's no saving him. He's a victim in this, not irreversible, like eternal cycle, this uh, eternal triangle. But the way Ben put it to me, my cousin Ben put it to me this morning, was the movie Triangle. Now, it's a horror movie starring Australian actress Melissa George, but it's an American film. It's a, a brilliant, brilliant horror flick um, about the same kind of, similar kind of thing, where she's stuck in a loop. She, constant, she can kill herself there, but she'll start again there, and all her bodies start to pile up, and she murders people, but she keeps coming back to this boat. And she keeps coming back to this boat until there's like 50 dead Melissa Georges and her acting just kills her. And I love that fucking movie. But Ben didn't explain it to me because I don't think he knew either. But there's something about that. So like, fair enough. She has to go to the boat every time in Triangle. But it starts with her in her house after she's walked away from a car accident and her son dies. And there's a moment where a character comes up and says to her, listen, like, there's nothing you can do. And she's like, well, who are you? And he's like, I'm just a driver. You can't save the boy. He's a victim in this, in this circle. But she's doomed to repeat it forever. So I'm not going to explain that. It's not like a time travel paradox. It's something completely different. It's the whole life is a wheel. And it always returns back to where it started. And nobody can stand on it for long. There's nothing we can really do about it. And I think I'll leave it there. So read it. It's a really good story. Um, I'm going to say, though, when I first read it, I liked the idea. When I read it again this morning, um, it, was, it was better written than I remembered. So I had a lot of fun watching the way King really put this together, even though I was a bit confused, you know, until I thought about it before I talked to you guys. It's really well written. It's really well put together. It's entertaining. It shows his skills. So, yeah, technically it's not that original. Because, you know, other things have done this. But he does it in his own way. And, uh, and there's a mystery there. Even though he thinks it's about religion and hell, I think there might be a bit more to it than that. And it definitely opens your mind to thinking about these things. So, um, listen... Look after one another out there. You know, it's a crazy, crazy mixed up world and accidents do happen and people get hurt. But if we look after one another and we respect one another and we talk to one another, you know, we can get through this together. So, you know, read some great books, watch some even better fucking movies and don't ever take any shit from anybody. See you later.